People were panicked. Lots of noise. Trees crashing all over the places. The, the place was filled with fog. We talk about the fog of war. It's not only confusion and chaos that bring out the fog, but of course we know on the 14th of March, 1862, there was a lot of fog. It was raining. It was foggy. And you had on top of that the, uh, the smoke. So you could barely see in many cases. And all of the, the trees from here all the way over to the hill over there, you can't see them, have been felled in that direction, in the direction of the advancing Union force, to stop them, slow them down, make them get out of that water, and expose themselves to the fire of the Confederates. Remember I told you before that the Confederate forces here had not ever fought before. So they were getting their baptism of fire. Unfortunately, they were not only inexperienced, they were ill-equipped and not very well led. Uh, Abraham Galloway was born in uh, uh, Southport, uh, uh, at that time called Smithville, uh, south of Wilmington, North Carolina, in 1837. His mother was a, a slave woman. His father was a haughty, arrogant, uh, dashing young uh, uh, southern planter uh, and boatman, and uh, who later becomes a blockade runner during the Civil War. So by the time the war starts, or very soon after the war starts, Galloway has infiltrated the South, and he serves as a spy, and then what we would call today, a, I think, a spy master, working with a network of slave spies that runs at least to Virginia and North Carolina. He, for a long time, he's based in New Bern. Um, most of the time, he's based in New Bern. But he does missions. Uh, his crowd does missions hundreds of miles behind enemy lines, and he does missions at least as far as Vic Vicksburg, Mississippi, and New Orleans, Louisiana. My students always compare him to a uh, singer Prince. If you can imagine Prince sauntering through the Civil War, because Galloway was arrogant, vain, tempestuous. I mean, you know, assaulting white Union naval officers is generally not the policy you're supposed to follow, no matter black or white, but Galloway and their court-martial. I mean, nothing happened to Galloway, their court-martial. There was this wave of political reaction happening. Almost all the other black legislators that were in, elected in 1868 lost office in 1870. Um, and there was a, um, you know, widespread racial violence throughout the state. Um, the National Republican Party uh, uh, had decided that they could live without blacks, without black voters. It wasn't just, you know, the other side that it was also their own side that had, that had uh, in many ways, betrayed them. Uh, Galloway was one of the very few uh, uh, re-elected, and to some degree that had to do with his popularity in the African American community, um, his power in the state senate. When he's in the state senate, he's probably one of the three or four most powerful people of any race in the in the state senate, um, and uh, and then it also had to do with his appeal to uh, uh, to white voters. He always held together a biracial, black and white coalition, and he he leaned into his biracialness. He would brag about being uh, well when he was upset at, at whites. He would stand up. I remember he stood up on the Wilmington courthouse at Raleigh. I can't remember and talked about how he would like to slash his veins if he could and let out all the white blood. There's no proof that he died of unnatural diseases, but um, he died um, um, uh, uh, during a time in which there had been repeated attempt assassination attempts on his life, and there weren't... Um, uh, 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 he died suddenly his wife and children were in New Bern. They couldn't get back in time. And he died um, 
at a time when there was no epidemic disease going on in Wilmington. Well, he died at his mother's place in, in, in Wilmington. I think it just has to be a question mark. There's, there's no historical proof that he was poisoned or something like that, but you just have to wonder. Um, and at that point, uh, you know, his death kind of comes at a time when it's, um, in some ways, he was one of the last men, or one of the last black men standing. Emmeline Pickett uh, was born in uh, Hollow, uh, east of here, and her family then moved to Crab Point, uh, down in Carter County. And she had opportunities as a young girl to meet many of the uh, Confederate soldiers and uh, uh, to enjoy their company and uh, to be supportive. Uh, when this part of North Carolina, Newburn and eventually Beaufort, were occupied by Union troops in 1862, uh, then Emmeline Pickett continued to help the Confederate soldiers, primarily with her activities as a spy and as a, a letter carrier. And she had a rather unusual way of uh, doing those things. She was, uh, of course, wore a big long skirt with uh, uh, lots of uh, opportunities for hiding things, and she had pockets under that skirt. And sometimes, it said, would carry as much as 30 pounds of uh, mail and uh, uh, of messages uh, from behind these Union lines. Uh, often identifying uh, information that had been given to her by mariners uh, about uh, uh, Union supply lines and uh, all kinds of information. When she was eventually captured in 1865, uh, one of the places where she was imprisoned for a short time was this house behind me, the Jones House uh, here in Newburn. And uh, Emmeline Pickett was, was, was questioned, but eventually released, even though uh, it was quite clear that she had been doing some spy uh, work for the Confederacy. Uh, she lived uh, the rest of her life in uh, Moorhead and remained active in, uh, in historical affairs there. One of the most interesting stories, I think, though, is that when, when Emmeline Pickett was apprehended, uh, she uh, was to be searched. But, of course, they needed to have a female searcher, and the female who was presented to search her was a black woman. Now, uh, Southerners, uh, white Southerners, uh, had often quite intimate relationships with, with black people, but she refused uh, to be searched by a black woman, perhaps not so much because of, uh, of racial prejudice, which she no doubt had, uh, like most people at that time, but as a strategic move because uh, they then were required to send for a white woman to search her, and in the interim, she ate much of the evidence, tore it into small pieces, and devoured it, and so when they arrived back, much of what they wanted to search for uh, had already uh, been consumed. Uh, they did find a little, though, and uh, enough to uh, hold her uh, prisoner, but she was released, and interestingly, she would discuss many things about her role during uh, those times, but she never would reveal what led to her release, so we can only speculate. able to uh, support herself uh, through her photography during a very difficult period, particularly during the Great Depression. She did not start out as a photographer, but uh, when Bayard Wooten uh, divorced her husband uh, and um, uh, needed to make a living, uh, she was doing a little painting and then branched into photography, and the rest, uh, as they say, really is history. I was fortunate to know her in, in my youth. Uh, but uh, she was one of the first women to ever fly, perhaps the first woman to fly. She flew in a Wright uh, Brothers flyer so that she could take aerial photographs. She was one of the first uh, women uh, to take photographs for the U.S. Army and, in fact, insisted on being inducted and uh, having an Army uniform as she was going to take pictures. Uh, again, a remarkable woman from a remarkable family, uh, all of whom... Uh, uh, made great contributions to the history of this area.
established uh, a uh, drugstore here in Newburn uh, with a soda fountain, as many drugstores had in those days. And he was very interested in people's health, and among other things, he invented a little tonic uh, that became known as Brad's Drink. Uh, and uh, and uh, in 1898, and it eventually became Pepsi Cola uh, from the pepsin enzyme, although it didn't contain any of the pepsin enzyme. It was unusual in that it had uh, uh, had, had none of the uh, uh, drugs that some of the other cola drinks uh, had at that time, and, and uh, therefore it was endorsed by many people for its health effects on digestion. Uh, Caleb. Uh, drink, uh, uh, Brad's drink, eventually, as uh, I said, made Pepsi-Cola, and uh, its uh, fame began to spread uh, beyond Newburn. Uh, eventually, he uh, moved his, his drug store a block away to the corner of Middle and Broad Streets, and even built a bottling plant here in Newburn. Uh, the Pepsi business was going great uh, until the First World War, and during the First World War, it was very difficult to obtain sugar. And after the war, uh, the price of sugar having been controlled during the war, after the war, the price of sugar shot up and Caleb brought, bought some sugar futures in order to assure that this drink would continue to have success. The price of sugar then dropped and uh, he could not charge more for his drink and unfortunately uh, he went into bankruptcy and, and sold the company for around $35,000. He returned to his pharmacy business, uh, where he worked uh, for uh, the remainder of his life. He lived, by the way, in this very fine home just behind me, uh, a, a beautiful Italianate home built in Newburn before the Civil War. So while Caleb Bradham, Bradham was not a native Newburnian, he was nonetheless a Newburnian of whom we are justly proud. Everywhere you go today, you see Pepsi, and uh, we're proud that that's a Newburn product. two fires. Yeah. Okay, the first one, one was started. at Roper Mill mm -hmm. at 8, 8.30 and then, and then the second one came at Kilmarnett Street in Hester Bryan's house. Yeah, right. And from there, the one on Kilmarnett Street is the one that supposedly, you know, nearly destroyed the whole town. Yeah. That one started later. About an hour the later. Early, earlier fire. Yeah. went through and destroyed all the homes on George Street. Right. But the, the firemen were already at the mill yeah. fighting that fire. And oddly enough, they technically weren't supposed to be there because the mill was outside the city limits. But also, the mill was the great one of the biggest employers in town, so you wouldn't stand idly by and watch it burn. So the other thing is that they were shorthanded because a lot of the people were out of town to a championship football game. So all of the firemen that were here responded to the fire at the mill. When the fire whistle called for the fire on Kilmarnett Street, they didn't respond with the first one. Of course, when the firemen got to the Kilmarnett Street, they didn't have the right equipment to hook up to the water hydrant, so they had to come back to the station to get the correct equipment, and while they were gone, another house started to burn, and when they got back, the wind had picked up, and it was just too late. Because it was such a big fire, they were trying everything, and when dynamite didn't work, they went, well, they sent out a call for help. And firefighters from Washington, from uh, Greenville, from Kenston, not Greenville, Kenston, and Moorhead City, the Coast Guard, Pam the Coal Cutter was here helping to fight the mill fire. So they just came on over to help fight that fire. It is still the greatest fire fatality in the state of North Carolina. And they've had some big, big fires since that time. But in, in um, cost-wise, which was $2 million back in the day, it was 
the greatest fire disaster in the state of North Carolina, and still is. Uh, you know, when, when I met Miss Carter, she was probably 86, 7, 8. I visited her three or four times. And uh, as you all know, she was a, sort of a legendary uh, uh, and imposing, intimidatingly imposing um, teacher, uh, public school teacher in the uh, African-American schools in New Bern. And then I think she went through the, she retired right after integration. And um, she had been a small child um, uh, uh, at the time of the fire and had to flee the fire as it swept through uh, her neighborhood. I remember her telling me stories about how people were running down the street telling her that St. Peter's was burning and I guess all the local churches eventually. And they took refuge uh, in the cemetery like a lot of people did. Um, some people were still burned in the, or some, some possessions I think were still burned in the cemetery. Uh, the winds were so high that the sparks were flying and catching people. Um, and she described going back, um, uh, you know, several days later. And, and you've probably all seen those old photographs of what the neighborhoods looked like, just one chimney after another, that sort of graveyardy with nothing else but cinders. And they went back and couldn't, they couldn't even recognize where their street was for, for a long time. She was my fifth grade teacher, and she'd take us out on walks to see the history in New Bern. We'd come down and see Christ Church and the Federal Post Office, and she'd talk about the Great Fire of 1922 and how it burned most of New Bern and how her friends and her family's house was dynamited rather than burned. The city thinking they could set up a fire break, dynamited houses on Queen and Metcalf Street to hopefully present a fire break, but the fire just leapt right over it, started the trees are burning. And then it went down George Street, around the Pastor Street, and burned, burned, burned. Like a lot of people, they moved, um, uh, they moved in with a relative. I think she said they had six people in a room six or seven people, uh, four kids in a bed for a long time. Um, she said that they were, she was so young that they considered it kind of an adventure. You know, the kids, that all of a sudden, you know, six people in a room is sleep every time, sort of, you know, and, and uh, uh, but she remembers that the, the toll that it took on her mother and the rest of the family. While they, they lived in the tent city for, um, no, I guess they, I think they lived in the tent city for a little while and then went to the relative. I think they, they, you know, there was a, a large Red Cross tent city for, for a while. Each family was given two tents, one for sleeping and one for cooking. The, they had a, um, a hospital tent. They had a um, health department tent. And it was just like a tent colony, a whole community, sort of like they do now when they go out on military bivouac. Everything you needed was in Tent City. Was your daddy here during the fire? My daddy might have been. Uh-huh. Because he rebuilt, didn't he? Yeah, he rebuilt the fire. I mean, your house. He was a what? A mm. What was your daddy? A brick mason. Uh huh. Yeah. So he helped to rebuild your house that burned in the fire. Okay. Did your uh, daddy? Did he help? rebuild the uh, AME Zion Church? Yeah. Where would everyone go to church after the church was destroyed, Mother? Do you know? It went down in the basement. Down in the basement. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. St. Cyprus wasn't burned? But no, St. Cyprian. Peter's was? St. Cyprian's became the hospital. St. Cyprian, my, my... Oh, St. Cyprian's? I said St. The old St. Luke? 
Yeah. Yeah. Hospital. Yeah. Reverend Johnson was. He wasn't the minister there then. I uh -huh. Saint Cyprian, because I have some family members, the Dillahunts, that was related to Susie Conrad. Uh -huh. Her son was born in Saint Cyprian's Church, and they named him Cyprian. Saint Cyprian. Huh. His name was Saint Cyprian. His name was Cyprian Dillahunt. Cy yeah. Saint C Cyprian C Emergency C Dillahunt. That's what <laughs> the thing says. Saint, Saint Cyprian? Cyprian Emergency Dillahunt. I never knew. That's it. the name they oh. gave him. They called him Sip. Yeah, I know. Really? They yeah. live right next door. They to named us. him Saint. The doctor Cyprian. named him Saint Cyprian. Epip emergency. Well, I know. <laughs> I know Saint Cyprian. I know they named him. I know he just died Cyprian. a couple of years ago, right? Yeah. Oh, he did. Uh -huh. I think it kind of showed the type of town that was in existence at the time, and the way that people came together to help and work. Of the three thousand and twenty um, families affected, only twenty of them were white, and the rest were black. So that was in itself kind of stark. I mean, people lost everything they had, homes, work, places. They had absolutely nothing. Before the fire, black and white lived side by side all over the place. After the fire, George Street became a dividing line. And it would effectively put black people on this side and white people on this side. But I think the just the fact that community played a real part. And even though people slept in tent, it was better than sleeping on the street, you know? And so how people responded to catastrophe by opening their arms to help says a lot about the people of the community. And I think that part is still here.